So now let's think about another type of selection. Um, let's think about a selection situation in which we have our fitnesses. And we're going to represent them a little bit more abstractly now than before. So we'll have 1 plus s, 1 plus s, and 1. So these two genotypes will have the same fitness. So now let's think about what characters we can use for our two alleles here. The capital A allele is, well, those homozygotes are better than this homozygote, right, because their fitness is higher, so they're advantageous. And then they're also dominant because having one copy is the same phenotype as having two copies, right, because their fitness is the same. And having one copy makes them look not like the other homozygote. So again, to point out, advantageous is not the same thing as dominant. They're two separate things that have to do with the fitness of the heterozygote. Now this lowercase allele, the fitness of this homozygote is lower than the fitness of this homozygote. So the lowercase allele is deleterious. And then this lowercase allele, you require two copies of it for those individuals to look any different from the other homozygote, right? Heterozygotes look like capital A homozygotes. When you require two copies of an allele to see the phenotype, that's when we would describe it as being recessive. So if we're looking at fitnesses like this, we're looking at the selection for an advantageous dominant capital A allele or selection kind of against a deleterious recessive lowercase a allele. So let's use our equation to um, see what we can come up with for the change in frequency of these alleles. So um, this is kind of our starter equation for all of our derivations. So let's plug some of our um, things in here. This P, Q, W, bar will stay the same. P, W11 was 1 plus S minus this, so that's a minus 1 minus S plus Q. W12 was 1 plus S minus this. So we have some cancella cancellations that go on there, and there, and there. And actually all we have left now is S times Q. Right, because that all canceled down to zero. And so writing this out, we get S P Q squared over W bar. So the change in the value of p is given by s p q squared w bar. So if we think about what this means is when p is small and q is large, that would be when this thing is the largest it could possibly be, right? When p is large and q is small, because remember, they trade off against each other. Well, these things are both less than 1, and this thing is being squared, so when q is small, squaring it will make it even smaller. That will give us delta p being the smallest. So remember, both p and q are less than 1. It's which one is getting squared that's going to have the biggest um, effect on making this small. And what that's going to look like in terms of what is the value of delta p versus p, right? So when p was small, this is the largest, and when p was when p was large, this was the smallest. So there'd be some sort of um, relationship in here where um, something like this. And what that means is if we're going to plot the value of p over time, similar to what we did last time when you think about a brand new kind of allele or a very low frequency of the capital A allele, it'll increase at the beginning um, quickly, right? Because when P is the smallest, delta P is the largest. As it becomes more common though, it'll get small, slower and slower in terms of its increase. And we expect to see something like this. And actually by the time P gets to be very common, very large, by the time this gets to be almost one, this is now very small and it's being squared, which is going to result in a very, very small delta p. So by the time p gets close to 1, 
the rate of change here will actually become very, very slow. And in fact, it can take an extremely long time for p to get to 1. And so what we see from this result is that it actually takes a very long time to completely fix advantageous dominant alleles. And fix is our technical term for when a frequency goes to 1, or when an allele becomes um, the only allele we see, right? the new wild type. And so if we have a capital A allele, even if it's advantageous, and even if it's dominant, it actually takes a really, really long time to kind of finish off this very last little bit of frequency here. And this long time to completely fix advantageous dominant alleles, this is the same thing as saying it takes a very, very long time to eliminate deleterious recessive alleles. And this is interesting because if you think about it, most genetic diseases that we have today are deleterious, right, because they're a disease, and many of them are recessive, or almost all of them are recessive. And one of the questions that sometimes people ask about evolutionary biology is, well, if natural selection is so great, how come we still have genetic diseases? Why are all these bad alleles still in the population? Why hasn't natural selection gotten rid of all of them? And the answer to that concern comes from this um, relationship here, that it actually takes a very, very long time for a population to get rid of the last few deleterious recessive alleles. Um, natural selection does a pretty good job of selecting for advantageous alleles and getting the population to a state where most individuals have those advantageous alleles. But it does not do a very good job of eliminating the last few deleterious recessive alleles from a population that has them. And this result from population genetics allows us to better understand why genetic diseases are still around and why the genetic disorders that we see today Almost all the deleterious recessive ones, because they take longer to eliminate, rather than deleterious additive or deleterious dominant ones, which are actually much more quickly eliminated from a population.